Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and I have a guest with us who, this is his second appearance on the Libertarian Christian Podcast, and I'm having him on for pretty much the same reason. I like to talk history with Jeff, and uh, that's actually his real name, and you can find him at historywithjeff.com, but his podcast, which is where you really want to tune in, is History Comes Alive. Jeff, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Doug. I'm glad to be back. So I think it was uh, probably about a year ago you came on and we talked about your podcast because I was really excited about its launching and getting sort of in-depth into some historical events on American history, which is really what your focus is right now. And in the meantime, what I've really learned to appreciate is that you really can't grapple with the issues of the day the issues of their day in history, if you don't actually spend the time doing it, like you don't actually spend the time listening and studying and understanding things. You know, you've mentioned to me off air that like a lot of people like to pick their popular, you know, memories of what they learned in school about, about things. And we were sort of lamenting that we just kind of pick and choose about what we want to remember. And like, how do we develop critical thinking based on that? Because you really can't, you have to really understand the subject matter and it's not a discouraging thing. It's more encouraging for me because I want to just like listen to more of it or read more of it, depending on how you want to consume this kind of data. So it seems that this is sort of a passion of yours to really help people not just learn facts, but to understand how to think through understanding American history. Yeah, you know, it's funny. History has always been kind of my thing. I just enjoy it. And what I've noticed as I've gotten older is even folks my age where, you know, when you're younger, you think if that person is an adult, they know everything, you know, or they have clear thinking skills. And (laughs) the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that's not always true. We tend to be experts in trivia oftentimes, and, you know, myself included, but I'm getting better at realizing where my limitations are. But yeah, people will say they like history. And then when you start having that discussion, what you quickly realize oftentimes is they have personal preferences and persuasions from, you know, their eighth grade history class. Mm -hmm. And they base decisions, political, social, economic decisions on what they learned at 13 years old. And they really haven't, you know, explored a whole lot after that. And so it's kind of alarming. I think most of us walk around that way with a variety of issues, but History is important, and it really comes down to the difference between trivia and knowledge. If you trivialize something, you're minimizing it, and it's just really a fragment of what the truth is. And I think most of us walk around with more trivia than knowledge. Hmm. How much do you think that might be related to classrooms being possibly, and again, I don't think you are making this statement, so I just want to kind of get your sense of it. It's like, when you're 13 and you're reading history or even whatever age as a kid, you're getting that information from a vantage point, sometimes from a left-leaning teacher, maybe sometimes from a right-leaning teacher. How much of that do you think is affecting the way people think about history today or how kids think about history today? I think that's a great question. I think it affects them a lot, but there are certain facts of history that are just facts. And, you know, the issue with popular history classes, like with compulsory education, let's say public educational system, you've only got so much time. The goal is to create the concept of culture and and give the students, you know, a sense of belonging to something. What's their place in the world? And so I think that right-leaning, left-leaning, I think you can really see some differences in those approaches. But to me, it's just going to be pop culture at the end of the day anyways. And if you really start to take an interest in history or in society around you and you want to know how things work, I think you're going to naturally gravitate towards, you know, deeper concepts. And, you know, the problem is we are so comfortable in our culture that, 
you know, we've been anesthetized for a long time in a lot of ways. And so we've we've learned to be happy with what we have. And we we're not stretched or pushed or challenged enough to actually have to understand the world we live in. And to me, that's the bigger issue. Yeah. Well, before we get on to further topics, this whole discussion about kids learning history in school has made me kind of want to ask you this a little off script. What do I tell my teenager who's like, why do I need to care who the third president was? Or for that matter, you know, the kinds of things that they need to know. This is, this is in a homeschool setting. And so it's not like this compulsory education where it's like, hey, you just got to memorize a test and get by the school year. I mean, there is, we expect our children to learn about American history to some extent. And it's like, I kind of don't have an answer because there's a lot of things in my world where I didn't pay attention to those things when I was growing up and I'm doing that now and I'm fine. Like, I feel like, right. oh, well, I learned some of these things now. Now, I feel kind of embarrassed that some of those things that I didn't learn, I didn't pay attention to because I didn't care because now I'm actually suffering from a, you know, I'm not suffering, suffering, but like I'm <laughs> suffering from the inability to process certain things. I'm not going to declare what those are. They're not related to history, I promise you. But the, uh, anyway, what do you tell a teenager who is like, why do I need to know this? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because in our house, our kids aren't given a, an opportunity to ask that question. I'm sure they would like to. <laughs> I'll give you an illustration, though, of why it's a good question and how you can kind of answer that from my perspective. Years ago, before I was married and had kids, I was friends with a guy. He was, you know, 20 years older than me. And he had four teenage kids. And his youngest was, I don't know, I think she was about 13. And I went over to his house one night and he very proudly had her come out. And he said she could name every American president from Washington to George, George, uh, Bill Clinton. George Clinton was actually a governor of New York long ago. But at any rate, <laughs> she could name all the presidents from Washington to Clinton. And she came in and she rattled him off. I mean, it's very impressive. And my friend was so proud. I, I had seen him over the years do this with her several times. He just could not have been prouder. And it impressed everybody in the room usually because they didn't think a lot either. And um, because they couldn't do it, right? Right, right. But the reality is, what did she know about them at all? Like the fact that she could rattle off memorized names didn't tell her the policies that they passed. It didn't tell her who the antagonist was of the day. Like, why did they win that election? What was the what was the opposing view? What was it that drove society during the third presidency of the United States of America? You know, and to that end, it was Jefferson and Jefferson and Adams hated each other. And so the reality is, is that when you take a look at who the third president was, the third administration was Adams. The third president guy was Jefferson. He beat Adams in 1800. But when you start to look at what they actually argued over, then it becomes a lot more interesting. So you go to history class in school and you memorize the, the order of the presidents and you memorize certain things about each guy and then you're done. That's your popular education. But then you get older and you start to realize like just how much John Adams and Thomas Jefferson hated each other and just how different they were in their ideologies. And both of them contributed significantly to the birth of the country, you know, before the current constitution, and then certainly afterwards. But there was a visceral hatred. And in today's world, I know I can get lambasted for this, but in today's world, Adams would probably represent more of the conservative English type of guy, and Jefferson's more of the liberal French guy, you know? Mm. And, and so... The reason you want to understand the third president of the United States is because in understanding what he dealt with and the policies that he wanted, then you start to understand what the ramifications were. Like, you know, Jefferson, he's an interesting guy. I hope I'm not getting too far off. No, no, this is a good question. Uh, but Jefferson's an interesting guy to me because he wanted a midsize agrarian society. Like he thought, that a mid-size, you know, agricultural society was going to be the best society. And yet it was Jefferson who unconstitutionally made the Louisiana Purchase and doubled the size of the country. You know, Jefferson was, he was anti-war. He did not 
you know, he didn't want to have to go to war. He definitely was more into trade and commerce. And it was yet like we, Ronald Reagan. He was all about limited government, but he doubled it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and then he fought the Tripolitan Wars against the Arabs. I mean, you know, so when you look at a guy like Jefferson, you look at the positions that he took, you know, as, as a candidate and what he ideologically believed. And then you measure that up with his presidency and what he actually was forced to face. Yeah. And so it's not that he's a hypocrite, you know, and I'm not downplaying the guy. We're at a point in our history where everybody was evil and bad. But the reality is, is that's why it's important to know who Jefferson was, because, Mm -hmm. you know, who was his adversary politically and what did he run on? What ideological positions did he have? And what was the outcome of that? Well, he ran on a small, medium-sized country that minded its own business. He doubled the size of the country unconstitutionally, I might add, and he fought our first foreign war. So he's an interesting guy. (laughs) So I'm going to push back just a a little bit about the whole like daughter who could recite the names of all the presidents and was that even worthwhile? Because I used to be that kid. (laughs) One thing that... So I'm listening to you. You actually tell this story in one of your most recent episodes. And I'm thinking, well, hang on. Because I could do that. Now, I don't remember them now, but what I do remember is I have a ballpark sense of the span of history within the time frame of our government. So, for instance, knowing that Lincoln was the 16th president, for some reason I know the presidents in the late 1800s. There's a few. I mean, of course, trivia is, you know, fun to know when you're playing a board game with your family who doesn't know that trivia, but that's not really relevant to like life and, you know, all of that. But all of this stuff did actually help me understand that like, okay, I can ballpark four to eight years for just about any administration and be like, oh, okay. So Lincoln wasn't really alive when Jefferson was around, right? Like yeah, there was, absolutely. they weren't together and, you know, you have Grover Cleveland later and like sometimes you do, again, off the top of my head, can't remember the guy who was in office for like a year or less or something. But there is a sense in which like, well, when you're young, it's okay to have some, you know, just sort of rote memory of like the presidents because there is a sense of history in the same way I would say that like memorizing the books of the Bible kind of helps you understand a little bit of the timeline of Israel's history. It's not quite true in a Protestant Bible because it could have been arranged a little differently, but does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And I would agree with you 100%. I figured you would. Um, yeah. I'm the host. You have to agree with me. Absolutely. <laughs> but on top of that, I do agree with you because that's the role, again, of, of popular history and of a compulsory education. Generally, I'm thinking public schools, but even in the homeschool curriculum and in the homeschool movement, the goal is to give the kids a general sense of who they are in the world. You know, And we live geographically you know, in a defined region of, I live in New York State, you live in Pennsylvania, but we live in the United States of America. And giving the general idea, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. And it does give them a, a, a database for like a chronological timeline. But again, the issue is when you start making decisions as an adult, knowing the order of the presidents doesn't help you ideologically go to the voting booth. And oddly enough, I think I'm in the minority. I don't generally vote just along party lines. I actually like to know what the issues are. And also, a lot of my opinions come from knowing some of the facts of even our own history. You know, the the idea of collectivism was tried by the pilgrims. One of the reasons they almost died the first year and starved to death was some of the lazier guys figured out they didn't have to work as hard and some of the other guys would work harder. But The fact is they ran out of energy. I mean, until they were each given a family plot and had to work through that, then that's when they, you know, they obviously had help from Squanto and Hobomoke. And, but the reality is part of that was on them. The communal lifestyle that they looked to implement simply didn't work. So, you know, when, if I go to the voting booth, depending on what the issues are, that kind of makes me nervous because there's other examples, but that's a very easy example to pick from that, we already had a pristine environment where that was tried and it failed. Mm, Yeah. So you've been doing this podcast for about a year and you decided to do sort of a revamp in a way of like your website and a little bit of, I guess it would be three episodes that are sort of an interim 
that, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because these interim sort of three episodes, this trilogy, if you will, is all about, you know, the purpose of government and sort of like, what do you do and how do you apply American history? Like how much do you actually know? I mean, we talked about the trivia versus knowledge piece. You started off the first one with the, what is the purpose of government? Asking the question, what kind of government do we have? And, and it's interesting when someone says, what's the purpose of government? If you were to just come up to me on the street and say, Doug, what do you think the purpose of government should be? I would talk very theoretically. And yet you started off in understanding that we have a particular form of government and that's what we're dealt with. And that's what we have to answer this question in. Like, obviously the theoretical, you know, discussions are fine. But in terms of like, how do you enter the voting booth? How do you talk about civics with each other in America? You have to talk about what is the purpose of our government because that's really the only useful question. Correct. Yeah, and so what's the standard answer when you ask somebody what kind of government we have? Well, what I hear typically is, oh, to promote the common good or, you know, for well, most of my friends are saying things like, you know, to defend individual liberty or to preserve individual liberty to keep the bad guys away, that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Usually what that comes down to or what most people are saying is we live in a democracy. And the fact is we don't. I actually had a guy contact me after one of my podcast episodes. It might have been from this series that said, you know, I never thought about that. I always thought we lived in a democracy, but the reality is we don't. And I'd like to take credit for him saying we live in something much better. That was the point I was trying to make. Mm. But we live in a constitutional republic, and there's a difference because we have democratically elected representatives. But and this but is only in that way are we a democracy. In other words, Correct. the voice of the people is the that's a very broad way of defining democracy. Yes, it is. And and people don't realize that there's safeguards to that. So we are ruled by the rule of law. And I think we can, it's another one of those things that we trivialize. We spit that out. And we say, I've got rights. And then the same person that says, I've got rights, you can't do that to me, will turn around and say, we live in a democracy. Well, in a democracy, the only rights you have are the rights that the majority is willing to give to you, right? So the constitutional republic that we have is what allows us to have the Bill of Rights, the freedom of speech, to do things that are not necessarily popular with everybody, the protection of personal property rights. And so... The form of government that we have, the Constitutional Republic, you know, the role of government in our society is exactly what you had said you and your friends are talking about. The role of government is to pave the way to give to each of us rights, the protections and the benefits of being citizens to basically pursue what makes us happy. And as long as I'm not infringing on somebody else's right, that's where that's supposed to stop. And, you know, what, what concerns me is, as we look out, and it's been going on for decades, it's probably been going on forever, but, you know, life began the day I was born, and so did history. But the reality is we constantly, we're moving more and more rapidly to a society where we don't recognize that that's the government's role. Like, we think the government's role is to solve our problems. And frankly, mm -hmm. it's not. You know, you can you can say the government's role is to protect you from evildoers. It's it's to protect you as you go about your business. But the government's job is not to guarantee you anything. Evildoer does not apply to the mean person on Twitter. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. And so the government's role under our constitution, the government's role is to provide for the, the largest amount of people the greatest opportunity to pursue their own objectives in life. I mean, some guys are happy having long hair and taking no showers and living in the woods and, you know, painting the stream every morning. And some guys want to get up and go at it for 16 hours in an office. Mm -hmm. And our form of government, our society, allows each of us to make those decisions. And I think we take that for granted because that isn't the case in a lot of places. And it is the constitutional yeah. republic. You know, we're a very unique nation. We were born and bred with the concept because of the colonial experience. We were born and bred with the concept in this country that, you know, the government is supposed to work for the people. We're citizens. We're not subjects. Mm -hmm. You know, and the great responsibility of that is that we, if we accept that, then we also have to be able to extend to other people 
their ability to pursue their own interests without us interfering with them. That's where we seem to have a big problem these days. Well, you're right. And it's one of the things that I have said over and over on this podcast this year, most likely in response to the last couple years of constantly, and it's mostly on the left, although the right has sort of demonstrated this over over the decades in its sort of puritanical pursuit of like moral majorityism. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I remember when non-Christians would sort of quote Jesus to conservative Christians in like the 90s when I was, you know, growing up. And they would be like, well, Jesus said not to judge. And someone a couple months ago said to me something along those lines, like, well, you know, some of these liberals, these left, left-leaning left people think that we're not supposed to judge. I'm like, no, they don't. They want to judge everybody. They want to have a say in how everybody is yeah. doing, running their life. They want to have a say whether or not they can actually have a meaningful job if they say something on Twitter that's wrong or not woke or whatever it is. And it's like, it's very sad to witness because you see, and I don't want to sound like a boomer here and be like, you know, these young kids, they just don't value freedom of speech, but these young kids don't value freedom of speech. They they don't value that deference to individual autonomy. Correct. Sorry, we could just, we could just have a moan fest here of, you know, lamenting all these terrible things. We should probably move on a little bit further than... than. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, though, we can move on, but it's a good bookend because the reality from the people that I talk to, the reality to that is that they take that position because they have, in fact, trivialized the world they live in, right? So we silo everything. You know, we're talk- if you want to talk about public education... It's an interesting thing. I've been saying this more and more. Um, I don't put very many deeply political things on my Facebook page. Some might say that's not true, but I don't. But the reality is we've lost the ability to have a larger conversation and we trivialize everything. So public education, we want to argue about gender roles and bathrooms and CRT and you know, we've lost sight of the fact that we used to have the best educational system in the world. And we're now, I believe, number 37 and falling. So I don't really give a crap about those other things until you learn how to teach the kids to read and write again. Mm. And, you know, that's the argument. I've got some friends that are more left-leaning than myself that really would endorse all of the things going on, all of the controversies that we see in the news or that we feel in our local school board meetings. They would really endorse a lot of this chaos. But, At the end of the day, they can't answer the basic question that I have for them. And that is, but how do we teach the kids to read and write? Like, you're so worried about, you know, a boy being able to go into a girl's bathroom if that's how he wants to identify that you're not worried about the kids not even learning basic math and science skills. Mm, Because you've so trivialized the argument down to someone's individual rights and, and liberties that you have forgotten that there is actually a responsibility to the greater society. And and that rolls right into, you know, what's the role of government? The flip side is what's the role of the citizen? Yeah, nobody wants to ask that question. No, because we don't want to be responsible. We Boy, do we want to be autonomous, right? I mean, yeah, it takes a great deal of responsibility and discipline to live in a free society. A free society by concept is scary. It's dangerous. That's why it didn't exist until a few hundred years ago. You know, and most of the world doesn't live in a free society today because that's a scary concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, this is Dr. Norman Horn. And if you like the Libertarian Christian podcast, then you'll definitely like our other podcast, Good News, Bad News, a roundtable where you can join me, Matt, Carrie, Doug, Aaron, and others as we analyze the news from a Libertarian Christian perspective. Check us out on YouTube, your favorite podcast app, or on libertarianchristians.com slash roundtable. People are motivated by different things, right? Like some people are motivated by freedom and, you know, autonomy and other people are motivated by safety, comfort. And if we don't understand where we came from and not just like, oh, we should honor the founding fathers because they believed in individual rights and rah, rah, we're willing to fight for them against a tyrannical government. Not that particular way of respecting them at all, but just understanding that freedom isn't free. And that statement we're recording this on Veterans Day. That statement isn't necessarily a statement about freedom isn't free, therefore we have to fight in wars. Freedom isn't free because it costs us the inability to interfere in other people's lives much as we would like to. Freedom requires something of everybody 
in order to maintain it. That does not mean war. I don't mean it that way. But yeah, it costs us, I should say. And, and that is something that we all should wrestle with. But some people are motivated by comfort. So where does that leave us? I mean, what does that lead to when people are motivated by comfort and like, especially when we have a pretty affluent society? I mean, they couldn't have just started a country as a socialist country. Like even if the founding fathers wanted to, we didn't even have enough abundance to even try. That's correct. Whereas now it's like, yeah, hey, look, there's all these wealthy people. Let's just try to use their wealth and make us all equal and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, well, and I think part of that comes down to the form of government that we have. So, you know, we have laws in place that prevent us from doing certain things and that enable us to do other things. It's the same thing as, you know, liberty is scary, giving everybody freedom. It's a scary thing. You have to take a deep breath. But the reality is, based on the system we have, if enough people want to change the system, they'll be able to do that legally, right? I mean, there's an allowance for that. So the hope is that enough people realize that applying themselves to, you know, their own endeavors and leaving other people to do the same thing is going to end up being the best thing for the most people, right? So Mm -hmm. every society, you're never going to be without the poor. You know, it could just be someone's been stuck by the system. Okay. Everybody likes to say that, you know, we're, our system has screwed some people, but frankly, some people are just stupid. Some people have addictions and problems and I, I feel bad for them. But the fact that you have an addiction or a problem doesn't mean the rest of society drives off the cliff. You know, some people are really motivated and all of these things have to be taken into account. And I think there's like a general bell curve for society. And most of us on most issues fit within that biggest, fattest middle part of the bell curve. And then as you go farther out from the center, it kind of flattens itself out. And so you're always going to have a segment of the population that wants to be more, you know, let's say socialistic. They're going to want more things from the government. They're going to want the government to give more things. They're going to want to, to, you know, redistribute wealth. But there's always going to be this competing side on the other end of that bell curve where you've got people that are really ambitious and really aggressive about what they do. And they're not going to be willing to relinquish that. And there's always going to be that tension. I think one of the things that makes me nervous about our culture and society today is that bell curve is almost flipping upside down. Like, you know, what's going on to the middle class here in the middle class? Because it seems like the numbers are growing on on both of the ends of that. And so what happens when, and I feel like we're approaching this point now, but what happens when a huge portion of our population wants to take the substance from the other part of the population who by and large, many of those people have actually earned through hard work, what they've acquired. I don't really want to know what's going to happen. I mean, we're we're heading there. We are. And trying to get people to understand that concept when they've been subjects of or victims of an extraordinarily poor educational system, you know, where we've, we've been actually encouraged to settle for mediocrity, you know, and that started long before Biden was in office. But even now, you know, with supply chain, You know, the insulting attitude of it's just so technical and difficult, you people won't understand it. Well, people do understand that it's more expensive to buy food and some of the stuff they like to buy is no longer available. They're understanding supply chain, you know, boots on the ground. Mm, I think that, you know, when when Biden made that comment last week, I think that the the applicable follow up question should have been, well, Mr. President, can you explain supply chain? You know, (laughs) so. We live in a society where we're being conditioned to accept mediocrity. And the more we accept mediocrity, frankly, what you're doing is you're providing that open door for covetousness, right? I mean, I've lived a slothful life. I've been I've been irresponsible. I didn't take advantage of public education. I don't have good reading skills. I'm not good at math or science. I've never actually had a legitimate job where I got a paycheck and paid taxes. And now as I've woken up as a young adult, I'm pretty pissed off about it. And I think that in order to get back into the game, I'm just going to have to take some of your stuff. I mean, is that the mentality that people have? Oh, Jeff, you're making me depressed. Well, (laughs) so the backlash is enough people will get concerned, you know, because these people aren't breaking the law by having that attitude. And again, this is where liberty is. It's precious. And, and, It does cost. It's not free. You know, freedom isn't free. 
But it's like the analogy, I know we talked about this before, but I know when Bill Clinton was president, you know, they had that slogan, it's the economy, stupid. And it used to drive me crazy in the 90s when they would say that. But the reality is it's true, right? I mean, so if you take a dog, by nature, we all love our dogs. I've got dogs. I've had dogs most of my life. We all love our dogs and they're almost human to us. They're a part of the family. But we forget that at the end of the day, the basic, you know, the basic nature of a dog is vicious, right? I mean, everything in the universe, everything in our world is either looking to eat somebody else or trying to avoid getting eaten. I mean, that's the reality, right down to the smallest microcosms of cells, right? You're either eating or you're avoiding getting eaten. So if you have a dog in its natural state, it will do whatever it takes to get food. And they can be pretty nasty, especially if you have a a good sized dog. I've I've got three dogs, two are approaching 100 pounds and one is about 140. If those dogs really decide they want to get something, they can be very destructive and very aggressive if need be. But we bring them into our homes, we give them a bed, we give them heat, we talk nice to them, we fill their bellies a couple times a day, And we end up with a very docile, loving companion. And so what happens with society now, I mean, I feel like it's a foot race. We have been that dog that's been well-fed for a long time. And as certain elements of society decide that, you know, and these aren't all like poor people, like there's rich people that are in on this too. So this isn't a race or an economic or an educational status here. But when certain portions of our society decide that people that have worked hard ought to give most of what they worked hard for to people that haven't, you're going to reach that, you're going to tip that scale at some point. And so those people that have worked hard to get what they have, they're the dog that's been placated. They've been placated by a system, a governmental system, a legal system that allowed them to pursue their own happiness. When you take enough of that happiness away from enough of them, they probably will make you stop doing that, right? The question is, where does that line lie? Does that make sense? Yeah, it all makes sense. I think we've all been made docile. I mean, I think that people will cozy up to the government because it promises good things to them, you know. Yes. But it doesn't require anything of them. Correct. And eventually when you've used up those resources, they come for more, you know? And I don't think people in Venezuela 15 years ago ever thought that their country would be in the condition that it is now, you know? I have a camp in the summer, six months a year, we spend, you know, half of our time sitting in the woods with a bunch of other people that sit in the woods. And we have a lot of discussions, you know? And these guys are are just regular Joes. And the one guy, there's always one or two of these guys in a group. I used to be one of them, but I've reformed now. But this guy said, you know, when society goes to hell in a handbasket, I'm moving down to the woods and I've got a lot of guns and, you know, I'll live off the land and I'll protect myself and and it'll be fine. And I said, you know, I'm sure that every society, there's groups of people that think just like you do. Mm -hmm. But the reality is when the really hits the fan, it's not going to be like you think it is. You know, again, I actually asked him, we were sitting around a campfire and I said, do you, Do you think in like 2005, there weren't guys in Venezuela that was, you know, really affluent, very advanced, industrialized, very wealthy by most standards? Do you think there were guys sitting around campfires in Venezuela as they saw Chavez coming to power, saying that if it ever happens, I'm going to take my guns and move to the hills? I'm sure there were. Mm -hmm. What, What happened to those guys? That didn't work. I mean, we can puff our chest out and we can beat our chest and we can make ourselves feel like Tarzan, but most of the time, that's only something that's theoretical because when the time comes, you're not Tarzan. There's a lot of factors that go into whether or not someone's even able to do that. Like, I've thought that too. I'm like, all right, let's say I had to sort of get out of Dodge sort of, you know, decision going on. I have places that I could go, but it's not what your friend just described where it would, you know, it's like live off the land. Now it's more remote, but it's nothing anywhere close to living off the land on by my own strength, so to speak, like the, like you'd see in a movie, right? Where yeah. the guy goes and just survives, like call the wild or, you know, whatever. Like, it's nothing like that. I mean, there is a, and I don't know if he even really would want it that way. 
most of us really wouldn't want it that way. And I think we that's why we probably do seek to preserve our liberty as much as we do, because we do want to live in community with others that we choose to live with. Yeah. And there's only so much, I mean, there's a lot of forestry out there and there's a lot of hills, but like there's only so much space, right? So what I want to hear from you is a little bit of how do we process history in order to answer the question, how do we live our best lives? And I would say, you know, sort of, well, seriously, but, you know, humorously, well, listen to your podcast because you give us a lot to think about and a lot to digest and, and, you know, ruminate on. But in terms of understanding and processing and applying history, what does that even look like as opposed to just hearing or learning all the facts? For me, and this is what I try to do in the podcast, I think I've used I've used this example. I, I know I did actually in one of the recent episodes. So let me back up for a second. I think learning historical facts is important, but also combining them with biographies. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a much larger panorama of what's going on. And then something that I'm hoping to implement into the podcast in the future, I've got multiple books I want to do this with, but then taking a look even at great literature, you know, the time period classics, because it really is like historical voyeurism, isn't it? You take a great piece of literature you know, I love Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm spending a lot of time, obviously, in, in New England on the podcast. We're in episode 60, I think I just recorded. And I think we've done probably 45 of those were in New England. But if you look at the historical facts of what was going on in New England, you learn a little bit. Doing some biographies on the guys that were there tells you a lot more. You know, most of the early military leaders in the Puritan colonies, these guys were veterans of the Dutch Wars, you know, and in the series that I've been going through, you know, some of these guys like John Underhill, he was English. His family was forced to flee England when he was a young boy. They went to the Netherlands. He grew up an English guy among the Dutch. He fought the Spanish in the Netherlands. He came over to the colonies. He got in a lot of trouble with the Puritans. So he offered them military service. And then he he offered military service to New Netherlands for many, many years. He had a, a public battle with Peter Stuyvesant. Um, he's a fiery, flamey guy. And he came from a, a very tough society and a tough culture. He did horrible things. You know, he, frankly, a lot of people would consider him a mass murderer. He annihilated people by the thousands. So looking at what John Underhill did, you can you can look at that from the English or the Puritan standpoint, or even a Dutch standpoint, and, and look at him as a hero because he was a military you know, conqueror. But if you look at it from like a Native American perspective, he you know, mass murdered like entire villages. Mm. And so learning from history is, is more about just the historical facts. It's learning more about a guy like John Underhill, what made him tick. You know, they were a very well-connected family in England and they ended up, you know, skedaddling. They had to flee. But what makes a guy like that tick? And then taking a Nathaniel Hawthorne, some great literature, most of what he wrote was reflective of Puritan society. And so when you get a good mix of those types of things, the historical facts, the biographies of some of the guys that really affected change, and then, you know, again, this historical voyeurism where you get a great piece of literature that's a timepiece, you start putting those things together and it it changes the, the way that you think about things. It changes your perception. It, it starts to make you ask very different questions than you did previously. And I think that's how we, you begin to apply history to today is, is really starting to understand how comprehensively you know, technical a lot of these things were that we take for granted. Hmm. I mean, so let me ask you this. When you were in school, do you ever remember them Maybe you did. I grew up in New York State. I don't ever remember them talking much about the New England natives, the, the First Nationers, outside of Squanto. I don't ever remember hearing about it. Mm, so I grew up in West Virginia, and that's in a region with plenty of Native American history, as it were. And so I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't remember, but my sort of recollection and memory of where did the Native Americans live, my mental picture or map of America sort of ends in New York. 
And mostly because I was big into maps and I can just mentally know that some of the names of places in New York state were named after like Native American tribes and, you know, yes. those kinds of, you know, the heritage is there. So I don't really think I mentally picture New England that way. I think New York, which is not really New England, is about the extent east that I mentally picture what I was taught. Yeah, and so, you know, again, they're just trying to give us a basic understanding of the world we live in, but to really be able to understand and apply history, you have to know, you have to fill in those gaps. And the more you read, the more you learn about those things or read biographies, I just found over the course of years that, you know, I always liked history, but my thought process is so different and the questions I ask are so different than they were a few years ago. And it's because of the, you know, the reading that I've done. I want to know more. One of the things that I've realized is things are not as simple as they're laid out. I think this is a quote. If it's not a quote verbatim, it's, it's pretty close. But I read a quote a couple of months ago. Somebody said, beware of the politician with easy answers. And that's true. You know, the attack on American history and culture right now that's going on. You know, some mm -hmm. of the things that they're bringing up are true. You know, some of the parts of American history are ugly. You know, the first thing is when we talk about the colonials, these guys weren't Americans. You know, I, I always love it when we talk about the pilgrims or Christopher Columbus as if, you know, America's done something horrible. America didn't exist for several hundred years. I mean, so <laughs> let's get the context right. Yeah. You know, slavery is still in existence around the world today. And so I get it. It's a horrible thing. It really is. If it doesn't turn your stomach, you haven't read enough about it. But in the same token, it's completely out of context to act like the only people that ever did that existed in colonial America. It just, that's simply not true. So if we're going to apply history, we've got to get the right context. I recently bought a book. I just started reading it, so I can't give you much of an update. But the name of the book is called Guilty Without Context. And it's talking about, you know, as we move into a postmodern age, it's talking about that very thing. Like, you know, American culture is guilty. We're guilty of everything, apparently. We're the largest stain on humanity, but there's no context behind any of it. Mm. You know, and one of the things that I've really pushed with the Puritans in this series is, you know, and I've read a lot of Puritan literature, so I do appreciate them in a lot of ways, but I've been pretty tough on them. But the reality is they weren't Americans. And they're more medieval than they are modern. So we would not even recognize the concept of living in their community. I don't think anybody, you know, we, we, we like to look back and what a great time that was. I don't think I've ever met anybody that would have survived in a Puritan society. They didn't have freedom of thought. They didn't have freedom of expression. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. we have to come to terms with the right context historically because atrocities were committed totally get it. But what's the context of the world they lived in? Yeah. And until we are willing to do that exercise, then we really probably haven't understood. It doesn't mean you can't answer the you know questions on a test. We probably haven't really understood exactly what happened. And so you don't have anything to really apply to solving problems today. Yeah. And, you know, what's sad is that if somebody were to hear you say that who really wants to rail against the, you know, the historical atrocities are going to say that you're trying to, you know, downplay the evil of it. And there's like nothing you can do to sort of say, well, no, not really. Like they're not going to be assuaged by you saying slavery is really bad. It really, really is. I don't want to downplay that. But in its context, it was better than the previous century, and now we're, that's even gone in our country. Like, you can't even say that because you have to somehow be absolutist about it. Like, there's no room for, like, you can declare, yeah, they were wrong, but, like, what's that going to get us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, mean, here's the other thing. It's like, okay, fine, all the founding fathers are racists and slaveholders and hypocrites. Okay, now what? Like, what yeah. does that even get me? I, I mean, should I not reveal... I mean, I guess that's the idea is that they want to discredit them so they can start their own, I, I don't know. But like, I wanted to jokingly remark, you said that we wouldn't survive in under Puritanism. And I'm like, well, I think the modern left would feel very much at home among them because like you can't do anything wrong among them. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're banished, right? Yeah. Like that's the attitude. Yeah, that's funny. We that's would have never predicted, Jeff, in the 90s, the way in which the far left 
is being sort of moral Puritans about literally everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the banter and the rhetoric is scary because, you know, the reality is I don't downplay the concept of slavery. So I had someone contact me a few months ago, you know, through the podcast asking about if I would do something, you know, they, they said something about, you know, doing a series on slavery. And actually, I want to do that. I want to do a series on slavery. And then if I, if I have the skill set, I love to do something on racism as well. You know, but again, the context is slavery still exists in the world today. The context is that Africans and Arabs sold Africans to Europeans. Europeans bought them. It wasn't just the English. It wasn't, you know, just the Americans. Those are facts. None of that says that it was okay. None of it justifies it. But I would go a step farther. You know, we still have racism and race issues in America. You know, and, and one of the things I've, I've done this a couple of times, and I'm not, I'm not original. I saw someone else do it. But when people say that I have friends that lean pretty hard right, and they will say there's no, they don't see racism in America. They don't understand. So then I'll ask them, okay, so do you want to be an 18-year-old boy in Alabama? How about Mississippi right now? If you don't think it exists, then you should have a problem with that, right? So there's a flip side to that. I mean, part yeah. of that is human nature and human society. We do have issues, but we've also tried to correct those issues. You know, and there's a lot of European nations. They have a lot smaller, you know, African-American population as they chastise us for problems that they easily could have as well. I mean, ask the French how the Algerians and North Africans, ask them how they managed to merge into their society. You know, I mean, go do your homework on that. You know, they had riots not very many years ago. I can't remember when, but I was in the house I live in now. So within a few couple of, you know, decades, they had race riots there. But, you know, the media in this country didn't report that. So we're not the only ones that have these problems. We are the only ones, though, that have allowed people to burn cities down. You know, we are the only ones that have allowed people to come up and have a voice and complain. And, and I'm not saying that it's not legitimate sometimes, but, you know, we are the number one destination for black and brown people around the world that want to come here. So it can't be, it can't be as bad as what some people are saying. That being said, you know, I don't know if you ever read John Howard Griffin's book, Black Like Me. No, I haven't. So it came out in uh, 1961. I've read it a couple of times. I'm going to, if I have the self-discipline, I'm going to be reading it with my two high school sons in the next year or so because it's a relatively modern book. And, you know, are you familiar with that book at all? No, I'm not. Okay, so uh, John Howard Griffin, he was a white guy and he wanted to, I haven't read the book in a long time, so I'll, I'll give you a quick synopsis. It'll be pretty accurate. He basically wanted to do his own research on race in America. So he went down to the deep South as a white guy and ingratiated himself to certain neighborhoods and areas. And then he actually died from cancer, I believe, from what he did is he, he took some chemicals and darkened his skin pigment. So he became a black man. It wasn't makeup. I mean, his pigment changed. And he went to the same areas and his book is he recorded that experience and, you know, where he went with sunshiny, you know, and people were very pleasant and it was easygoing as a white guy. He went as a black guy and he was in very hostile territory, you know, so so we can't say it doesn't exist. Racism even today, you know, or To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Same thing. It was the same time yeah. period, you know, and that's semi-autobiographical, right? So. Harper Lee's father was a lawyer in Alabama that was actually in the 30s, I'm guessing 30s, that was representing black people through the prejudice legal system. So to dismiss that there aren't issues is also trivializing American society. But when we flush the baby with the bathwater and when we act like this is the worst society ever, that we've done nothing to repair that image. We've done nothing legally or you know, procedurally as part of the system to rectify and remedy that. That's just simply intellectually dishonest. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate your approach to understanding history, to understanding critical thought. You seem very passionate about educating people with not just knowledge, but with the wisdom that comes with the responsibility of that knowledge. And uh, I 
hope your podcast you know, continues to grow and succeed. And I hope all of our listeners will listen to it and tune in. Give them the, uh, the details for us there and we'll wrap up. Absolutely. So if you go to historywithjeff.com, that's the website. And we just redid it. So what will happen is it'll, there's basically three tabs. You can see current episodes and you can see blogs, which I haven't done in quite a while, but I'm going to start. And then there's a Patreon button. And that's probably the best way. Or you could go to uh, hcapodcast.lipson.com. And I'm also on Instagram, history underscore comes underscore alive. Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, history comes alive. And I'd love it if you tune in. This was more of a philosophical approach, but these types of concepts are what's gone into the episodes. It's relatively chronological, but we do go back and forth a little bit time-wise, so that we, we develop concepts or subjects or topics, and then they overlap. You know, right now we're going through, after the Pequot War, the great controversies that the Puritans faced before they really kind of took complete control. And the first political controversy was with Mayan Tonomo. He was a Native American. They killed him. Then they had a political controversy with an English guy, Samuel Gorton and the Gortonites. And frankly, Samuel Gorton out litigated them in England. Um, they kind of lost that battle. And now this last one is the ecclesiastical battle over missions. But it's been this kind of approach. We want the background, the context of what happened, and then the aftermath, what, what happened to these people with the actions that they took. Well, thanks, Jeff, for joining me. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon sometime. Absolutely. Thanks, Doug. Had a great time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Thank you.